Hey, good morning, everybody. Christian Humanist class. I hope that you guys are all doing well. Thanks for being with me again. I am recording this on April 15th on a Wednesday, but this is for the April 16th Thursday class, the second and last class of our week. So if you remember, as we were talking on a previous class, we had been thinking about what was Russell Kirk, and especially as a young man, what kinds of things were influencing him? And I'd like to remind all of us, especially as we're getting into the older Russell Kirk now, that not only was Kirk extremely talented, both in the mind and with the hands for the typewriter, uh, was it not only was he an incredibly gifted writer in all kinds of ways and an incredibly gifted intellect. But he also had, if you'll remember, grown up in poverty. And that's going to matter a lot to his story because it's that poverty in so many ways that will help shape the charitable understanding of Russell Kirk. And I, again, as I said on Tuesday, I don't mean to suggest in any way that his charity doesn't come from charity. That is, that there's not an element of uh, a very very, 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 very strong element of Christian charity in all that he's doing. But I would like you to keep that in mind, that there are a number of things going on in Kirk's life. And when I left you on Tuesday, we were talking about Kirk's trip across the ocean in which he had just had a terrible breakup with uh, the woman that he thought he was madly in love with at that point. And in order to overcome that breakup, he decided he would throw himself into a great project. And that great project would be to bring Burke back into the world so that we would all have a deeper understanding of Edmund Burke. And that, that is exactly what Russell Kirk does over the next four years while he's a student at the University of St. Andrews. He continues to write in terms of writing things that are not directly to his uh, directly related to his dissertation but he focuses on that dissertation as well and he writes ultimately what is called the conservatives route uh, a route and that was an attempt to describe the history of conservatism but to do so in a way that made it seem as though ever since Burke conservatives had been failing, even though that they had been really trying to imitate their exemplar, Burke himself. But the world had just moved in too many wrong directions. And therefore, those who were defending Burke and those who were defending, therefore, what Kirk was labeling as conservatism were in fact on the losing side of history. Those of you who've read Whitaker Chambers, you know that Chambers had much the same view. Chambers, of course, though, very much unlike Kirk, who was a Jeffersonian, Chambers was a Marxist and had believed that the Marxist understanding of progress, though morally and ethically wrong, was historically accurate and that that was the future. Kirk wouldn't have gone that far, and he certainly was no Marxist by any means, any, any way, shape, or form, but he did think as he was writing his dissertation that he was writing about a lost cause. And when he started trying to get this book published, he first sent it to Alfred Knopf, the great publisher who liked it very much and wanted to publish this dissertation, but only if Kirk cut out about a third of it, the third dealing with British conservatism, Knopf wanted a book only dealing with American conservatism, and Kirk refused to do that. Kirk then turned to a small and very young but very energetic publisher by the name of Henry Regnery, who had a publishing house in Chicago. Regnery had only been in existence for about five years, but he had already made a name for himself by translating great German works in Christian humanism. That's what Regnery was known for. He was known for taking great Germans and popular Germans after World War II, these anti-Nazi Germans who had survived and were now trying to remake Germany in a Christian image. These people were the ones that Regnery started publishing. And he also started publishing the classics of Western civilization. So the great books he started publishing. And Kirk was mightily impressed with Regnery. And when he sent his dissertation to Regnery, Regnery loved it. 
and said, yes, let's publish it, but we have to change the title. We can't have such a negative title. And there's no reason Regnery said to have such a negative title. We don't really know where conservatism is going to go. And so they went back and forth. And finally, they decided on the conservative mind. And as Kirk later noted, that that tiny change, which of course is a major change, titles, as my good friend John Miller, head of the Dow Journalism Program, has reminded me several times, titles can make or break your book and therefore your ideas. So titles really do matter. And it did matter that this was no longer called the conservative's route, but was now called the conservative mind. Because by doing that, it gave, even though it could have been regarded as a neutral image, it was turned into a positive image. And people read the book and they looked at all 29 characters that Russell Kirk had put into his conservative mind from Burke and Adams all the way to T.S. Eliot, and they decided that there was a progress in and of itself that we were moving from Burke to Eliot, and who would be next? So it wasn't a kind of declension in which everybody had been diminished after Burke, but rather the opposite, in which everybody had been made better by Burke, and this was going to keep going. So Kirk said that this very change was a change from defeat to one of victory, not only in the title, but in the actual success of the book. That book comes out in early May, May 11th, if I've got that right, on in 1953. And when it does, it is instantly a bestseller. It goes through several printings that summer, and almost every single publisher and periodical that was worth anything, including the London Times and the New York Times, reviewed Kirk's book. And suddenly Kirk went from being this 35-year-old graduate student, now having defended his D-lit at the University of St. Andrews, so he had the equivalent of, in America, at least a double PhD. That's what the D-lit meant. It would be like getting two PhDs. Kirk not only was Dr. Kirk, and kind of double Dr. Kirk. No, no one ever called him that as far as I know. Uh, not only was he that, but he suddenly became this figure in Western civilization to the point where, as I mentioned to you two days ago, Time Magazine ran a story in which they labeled Kirk one of the 15 or 16 most important intellectuals of Western civilization. Uh, Time Magazine dedicated its entire July 4th issue of, that is, of the, the book review section of the 1953 edition of Time, dedicated the entire book review section just to Kirk's conservative mind. That was Whitaker Chambers doing, because Whitaker Chambers was the book review editor at Time Magazine at that point. Some periodicals, like the Times Literary Supplement, offered several different reviews of Kirk because they were afraid that they had got him wrong the first time. In fact, there were a number of major periodicals that gave Kirk an initial review, and then after Kirk's popularity just soared, they went back and gave it a second review. Most of those reviews that came out, and there were well over 75 in the major periodicals across the world, major periodicals and newspapers, almost all of those were positive. Not all were, but they were mostly positive. And Kirk, who was thrilled with that, also recognized that the criticisms he got were always of a similar nature. So number one, those people who didn't like Kirk's book or who even wanted to, who liked the book but wanted to take issue with Kirk, would accuse him of being a pre-modern man, which was meant to be an insult. I'm sure Kirk loved that. Uh, it was about the, the last thing you would say to Kirk to insult him, but it was meant to be an insult. It was that he was incapable, as one reviewer said, of living in the modern age and of dealing with problems of the modern world. And the second criticism, which was a just criticism by every mean, by any means, is that despite the title conservative of the conservative mind, Kirk hardly dealt at all with politics. His book is really a book of culture, art, literature, and religion. It is not a book of politics, and yet many, many people 
1953 all the way up to 2020, have picked up Russell Kirk's book, The Conservative Mind, and assumed that they could walk away from that book knowing what it meant to be a political conservative. Young Republicans, especially for 60 years now, have been picking up that book and thinking, or almost 70 years, right, have been thinking that that book would teach them what it means to be a political conservative. And that is not what the book is going to do. It was never what that book was meant to do. And Kirk was somewhat, though he loved the comment that he was too pre-modern to be able to handle modernity, he hated the idea that anyone went into the book thinking that they would gain some political understanding of conservatism because his idea of conservatism was one in which we can serve the best of the past. We're not trying to make a political program, but quite the opposite. We're trying to make a literary, artistic statement, a cultural statement, trying to look at norms and mores and customs and habits and laws properly understood. The New York Times, through Regnery, published a really interesting advertisement for the conservative mind. And I want to read that advertisement to you because I think it does try to capture the heart of what the conservative mind was about for the most part. As 19th century liberalism dims in its appeal, modern readers turn with increasing attention to the writings of Burke, Coleridge, Newman, Disraeli, John Adams, Tocqueville, Calhoun, Babbitt, and Santiana. The conservative mind is a basic introduction to the literature and main ideas of these defenders of truth and freedom. Russell Kirk deals with British and American thinkers in the line of Burke, who have stood by tradition and old establishments. A young American scholar, Burke commands a style worthy of the great heritage which his book upholds. The conservative mind is a definitive statement of the new conservatism. And that new conservatism was a term that had come into fashion mostly because of a figure by the name of Peter Vierick, who was a poet at one of the Seven Sister Schools, but also a philosopher who had written, even before Kirk, had written a couple of articles, major articles in the Atlantic Monthly and elsewhere, as well as books on the nature of conservatism. But Vierick, no matter how intelligent or how perceptive he was, would never have the kind of audience that Kirk would have. It really is the conservative mind more than anything else that shapes conservatism after the war. Kirk receives praise from all different kinds of people uh, and criticism as well, but he receives praise from all different kinds of people uh, everywhere. And again, it would have been impossible not to have taken this book seriously. I, I want to restate something that I stated in the previous lecture because I think it's really important for us to know. If you remember, when Kirk defined conservatism, he did so not by giving a specific definition other than that which we can serve, but by giving a number of tenets or canons, that is, a number of possibilities or principles that go into any proper definition, but he did so without being absolutely systematic or closed about what that definition is. In other words, and this was both something people praised and criticized of Kirk, he never fully defined the word conservatism, nor did he ever want to. He did not believe that there was one definition of conservative. And he would say later on, in fact, he almost said this a little bit flippantly at times, but he said that to be a conservative in 1953 in America, for example, was a radically different proposition from being a conservative in Incan Peru, his example, or in the ancient Egyptian dynasty. In those time periods, conservatives would do everything possible to advocate change 
rather than stop change. So there has to be some kind of underlying principle to what a conservative is. A conservative must not merely conserve for the sake of conserving, but there must be a principle that allows him to conserve properly. This is going to sound very much like T.S. Eliot's argument, if you'll remember a few weeks ago, his argument that all tradition must be judged by orthodoxy. If we have a tradition, but it doesn't allow for a Christian Orthodox understanding of the dignity and humanity of the human person, then it cannot stand. It is a tradition that must be either abolished or greatly reformed in order for a conservative to uphold it and to understand it. Kirk makes a very similar argument in his definition of conservative. And we see that over the seven and a half editions of the conservative mind, so it goes into print for the first time in 1953, Its final printing, while Russell Kirk is still alive, is the seventh revised edition, which means it is essentially 7.5. That comes out in 1986. And in those 7.5 editions, there are very different understandings in each book of what conservatism is and how the conservative should respond. So the conservative of 1953 is not the conservative of 1969 and is not the conservative of 1986. Kirk makes this very clear that the conservative must, through prudence, make judgment about that which is inherited. And so in the conservative mind, he gives us 6.6 tenets, or taking it from the Council of Trent, six ideas, our canons, in which we know little truths, but we have to be able to connect those little truths one to another. Later on, Kirk will use at times four tenets, at times five tenets, at times six tenets, and at most ten tenets. The first time that he uses 10 tenets, which I want to quote from today and give you these 10. So I gave you the six. Now I want to give you the 10 are from his really interesting little, it's one of his shortest books that he wrote, uh, but a beautiful book from 1957 called The Intelligent Women's Guide to Conservatism. And the reason for the title, it's, it's a It's a play on George Bernard Shaw's Guide, Intelligent Person's Guide to Socialism. Kirk is making a play on that. But it's specifically to women. Because Kirk had been asked by a number of conservative women's groups to write a series of pamphlets on the nature of conservatism and what it meant to be a conservative. And in one of these pamphlets called The Essence of Conservatism, He gives us 10 different points, and here are his 10 points. Men and nations are governed by moral laws, and those laws have their origin in a wisdom that is more than human. They are rooted in divine justice itself. So number one, there must always be moral laws, and those moral laws must always be rooted in the divine in some way or other. Number two, variety and diversity are the characteristics of a high civilization. This was, and this is something that I think we who are generally on the side of conservatives and libertarians often forget, there was a great fear at the end of World War II where everybody was coming back all these young men and women having come of age during the war, having come of age with the same uniforms and the same rules and the same norms and the same mores, having fought the same battles, having been for four years against the same enemy, and then coming back and getting kind of cookie cutter jobs in corporations and moving into mass pattern suburbs, there was a great fear on the left, but especially on the right, that America was quickly homogenizing and becoming some kind of mass conformist society. We often forget this fear because we are the products of that mass society. 
And therefore, we don't see it objectively in the way those just coming back from the war were seeing it, or those who had remembered what life was like before the war, how they're seeing it. So this was a great danger to both the left and the right, that somehow we would become this mass conformist kind of tapioca society in which we all dressed alike, we all spoke alike, we all looked alike, we all acted alike, we all responded alike. That was a very serious worry for Americans. And we saw it blatantly. We saw what that kind of conformity could do in Nazi Germany. We saw it, what it could do in Soviet Russia. But could it happen in a democratic society? Well, if we take de Tocqueville seriously, absolutely this can happen in a democratic society. And it could actually be far worse in a democratic society because it will happen more tamely and more subtly. And therefore, we won't react as strongly to it. We'll become habituated to these slow changes. So Kirk says that there are many, many different ways. And you can imagine that hideous strength has come out. 1984 will come out in 1949. Brave New World came out in 1931. There were very serious fears about democratic despotism, soft despotism, as had been defined by Alexis de Tocqueville. Number three for Kirk in his 10 points of conservatism. Justice means justice, right? the high virtue, one of the four great classical virtues. Justice means that every man and every woman has the right to that which is his or her own, to the things best suited to his or her nature, to the rewards of ability and integrity, to property and personality. We have the absolute right to control that which is us, but especially our ability to make moral decisions and to be a moral actor. Here we are endowed with free will. We must learn to govern ourselves, and in doing so, we can allow ourselves to be members of a civilized society. So real society, so far, if we think about the first three things that Kirk has argued, High society, high culture, high civilization, number one, has a moral law rooted in a belief in God. Number two, believes in variety because each one of us is created uniquely in the image of God. We each have our own talents and our own gifts. And number three, justice demands that we own ourselves. So, so far, this is what a high civilization does. Number four, Kirk says, property and freedom are inseparably connected, and economic leveling is not economic progress. Conservatives value property for its own sake, that is, I own these things, my ideas, my talk, my speech, my clothing, my pen, I own all of those things, but we do so because we believe that this is one of the greatest bulwarks against conformity and against the oppression of the government. By me owning myself and owning my stuff, I can keep a strong barrier between what I am and what my society is. And yet, through property, I obviously have to interact through society. So the ownership of property is an extremely healthy thing. Because on one level, it's absolutely mine. But on another level, property is rarely held in isolation. It is almost held, almost always held within a community situation. And therefore, there's a fluidity to property. So it has both fluidity as well as stability. And that's incredibly important. Number five. The true conservative must always recognize that power in every form is full of danger. And therefore, the best political state is one in which power is checked and balanced, restricted by sound constitutions and customs. And so far as possible, political power ought to be kept in the hands of private persons and local institutions. Centralization is ordinarily a sign of social 
decadence. So we must, number five, recognize that power is always dangerous. The concentration of power especially is dangerous. And so Kirk wants us to understand there are a variety of things, both political institutions, such as a constitution, but also habits that prevent that power from growing too strongly. So we want to keep political power in politics. We don't want it to spread to the economic sphere or to the cultural sphere or the artistic sphere or the familial sphere or to the sphere of religion. But rather, politics has its place, but it must remain in its own sphere. Right? Politics must. It's absolute. Number six, the past must always be seen as a great storehouse of wisdom. So the past is not something that we reject simply because it is past. Instead, we must understand that it is a great storehouse of wisdom. It is where almost every experiment ever conceived in terms of social and cultural interaction has already been tried. There are no new sins. There are no new things under the sun. We know that. Scripture tells us that. But these things repeat over and over again. And therefore, when we believe we've discovered something brand new, most likely it is only because we are ignorant of the past. The past, therefore, is a storehouse of moral knowledge. The conservative believes that we need to guide ourselves by the moral traditions, the social experience, and the whole complex body of knowledge bequeathed to us. What a gift! This whole body, thousands upon thousands of years of experience, have been bequeathed to us by our ancestors. The conservative appeals beyond the rash opinion of the hour and embraces what the great G.K. Chesterton called the democracy, the experience of all the dead. That is, the considered opinions of the wise men and women who died before our time They are the experience of a people. The conservative, in short, knows that he was not born merely yesterday. Number seven. Modern society urgently needs the association, the true community. The true community, Kirk tells us, is made up by those who govern us through love and charity, not compulsion. Here's a huge difference. When our mother and father have authority, we, at least as adults, give them that authority because they have earned that authority. The government rarely acts out of authority. It acts out of power. Power is based on coercion. Authority is based on respect. Kirk writes, Modern society urgently needs true community, true association. And true community and true association is a world away from collectivism. Real community is governed by love and charity, not by compulsion. Through churches, voluntary associations, local governments, and a variety of institutions, conservatives strive to keep their community healthy. And think about what we do on our campus. Now, even within our Republic of Hillsdale, we have so many little republics, little associations, everything from New Alpha to a few good men to our great sororities and fraternities on campus. Right? We have those. We have these smaller societies. So conservatives are not selfish, but public spirited. Right? They want to be involved in these communities. They know that collectivism means the end of real community, substituting uniformity for variety and force for willful cooperation. Sorry, willing cooperation. Yeah, that makes a difference there. Not willful, willing cooperation. In the affairs of nations, number eight, the American conservative feels that his country ought to set an example to the world, but ought not try to remake the world in his image. Now, 
This is one of the most controversial points of Russell Kirk's conservatism, and he dealt a lot with foreign policy. But one of the great arguments that Kirk makes is that our U.S. Constitution and the Declaration and the Bill of Rights and the Northwest Ordinance and the Articles of Confederation were never made for us to be an imperial power. They were made for us to be a republic, and they were made for a people who shared the same habits. And therefore, how do we have a good relationship with the rest of the world? We have a good relationship not by entangling alliances with anyone, as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson said, by right? great commercial really, uh, great commercial relations with everyone, entangling alliances with none, and that that's not that's not an exaggeration. They meant that. They meant no NATO. They meant no UN, no League of Nations. They were very clear about that. But does that mean we're selfish? No, of course not. Because as Americans, traditionally, we have always opened our borders and our property and our citizenship to any person around the world who is oppressed or wants to make the opportunities possible that America offers to come to America. So this was always the traditional role. That is, that we allowed people to come and become Americans but we did not take our Americanism abroad and force them to Americanize. We Americanized at home through assimilation, not abroad through the military. It is, Kirk says, a law of politics as well as of biology that every living thing loves above all else, even above his own life, his distinct identity which sets him apart from all other things. The conservative does not aspire to domination of the world, nor does he relish the prospect of a world reduced to a single pattern of government and civilization. Just as we don't want uniformity and conformity at home, we don't want a dreary, dreadful world of conformity abroad either. We appreciate the differences of religion, the differences of language, the differences of culture, and the differences of habit that we see throughout the world. We may not agree with the Hindu, but we respect the Hindu. We may not agree with the Muslim, but we respect the Muslim. And we may not agree with the Confucianist or the Buddhist, but we respect them. And we understand that they have the right to govern themselves as God has seen fit. Number nine, men and women are never perfectible. Conservatives know this and never are political institutions perfectible. We cannot make heaven on earth, Kirk stresses, though we could easily make hell on earth. We all are creatures of mingled good and evil. Right? There's the ultimate kind of Christian humanist statement. We are creatures of good and evil. And good institutions neglected and ancient moral principles ignored, the evil in us tends to predominate. Therefore, the conservative is suspicious of all utopian schemes. He does not believe that by power of positive law, we can make or solve the problems of humanity. We can hope to make our world tolerable, but we cannot make it perfect. When progress is achieved, it is through prudent recognition of the limitations of human nature. Real progress comes in restraining our will and restraining our desire to change the world, right? That's when we get real progress. All right, and finally, number 10, a recognition that change is not the same thing as reform. Conservatives are convinced these are not identical things. Moral and political innovation can be destructive as well as beneficial. And if innovation is undertaken in a spirit of presumption and enthusiasm, probably it will be disastrous. All human institutions alter to some extent from age to age, for slow change is the means of conserving society. Kirk is not against change. It's how the change occur occurs and in what moral spirit does that take place just as it is the means for renewing the human body. 
but American conservatives endeavor to reconcile the growth and alteration essential to our life with the strength of our social and moral institutions. We say, when it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. Men and women understand that we are best content when we can feel that we live in a stable world of enduring values, right? And that that is critical to who and what we are. Let me make one last statement on this from this book, his book on the idea of the Intelligent Women's Guide to Conservatism. On page 41 of my edition of this book, when he talks about the nature of government, and especially about government's understanding of the human person versus the abstract individual. He says, The true conservative does not want an insect society in which the wills of the great mass of people are made subject to the decisions of some oligarchy. Instead, the true conservative believes that the state exists to provide for justice and order and freedom of individual human persons. Not that individuals exist simply to serve an abstract state. He thinks that men and women never are truly human if their decisions are made for them by an omnipotent political authority. In other words, there is an absolute dignity in making moral decisions, even when we make the wrong moral decision, Kirk says. We must be able to exercise our free will. Well, I want to turn to another book that Kirk wrote, my favorite of his, at least of his nonfiction books, called A Program for Conservatives. But before I get to that, I also want to make this note that I started talking about the other day but didn't finish. And that is, Kirk has a wild trajectory when it comes to his own religious understanding. So Kirk is raised in a nominally, and I I hesitate to even use this word because I basically use it in the sense that he grew up in a house that was neither Catholic nor Eastern Orthodox. He grew up in a nominally Protestant house. But for those of you who are Protestant, if you're shaking your head at the moment saying, oh no, Dr. Berzer, you're going to get this wrong, I understand. Uh, And I probably am. But his form of Protestantism was really not a form of Protestantism that I think any one of us in this uh, classroom, this class, would recognize. I really do mean that he grew up in a non-Catholic, non-Eastern Orthodox house, but one that was nominally, nominally Christian. But his grandmother especially was deeply into spiritualism. And This was not that odd for people to come out of the lower middle class or the upper working class and to be very, very intellectual, but not to be Orthodox Christians. This had really been a part of 19th century America and 19th century Britain as well. Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Lost World series and of the Sherlock Holmes series, was also very much a part of the spiritualist movement. And the spiritualist movement was one that argued that there was a very, very thin veil between the world of the living and the world of the dead. So Kirk's grandmother was what we would call a seeress or a prophetess. She was a priestess. And she would hold seances and she would read tarot cards. And they used to have, they would, they would, at least according to Kirk, they used to levitate chairs and tables, and they would write secret messages on two chalkboards that they would then clap together as a book, and they would wait for the spirits to answer with chalk. And so they could open those back up, and there would be the message back from the dead. They did things like the Ouija board. I, I don't think it was called the Ouija board. I can't remember what those things are supposed to be called. They were into horoscopes. They were into reading tea leaves. Uh, Anything you can imagine that deals with 19th century forms of spirituality, that's what Kirk was brought up in. They used to commune with the dead. They used to look for ghosts. They used to talk to the dead. Uh, All of that was very much a part of Kirk's upbringing. For the most part, he rejects this, though he always, to the end of his days, kept a very firm belief in ghosts 
And really all the way up until the 1980s, he still read tarot. He gave that up because he started thinking it was demonic. Uh, but he, he practiced it for a long time in his adult life. Not stuff I would ever want to touch, but there it is. And so Kirk is raised in this household. But as he moves into his teenage years, like so many teenagers, myself included, he loses his faith. Uh, he starts thinking, you know, this is, this is bunk. My faith was, I was Catholic. I was not spiritualist by any means. Uh, but I lost mine as well, just, and Kirk did. Uh, he started losing this. And then when he starts studying Babbitt and more, he starts thinking pretty strongly about the idea that, well, all right. And remember, Babbitt's an atheist. Moore is a, a devout Christian or becomes one. He starts thinking, you know, maybe there is a God. He's thinking more of only the first person of the Trinity, not of the three persons of the Trinity. But maybe there is a God. And maybe it is actually reasonable to believe in a God. And then he takes it a step further. And he says, well, he, he writes this in a letter in 1942. He says, I may actually start believing in Christianity, not because I actually believe in Jesus or the Trinity, but because when I see the kind of people who hate Christianity, I want to be their enemy. So there, there's a kind of an irascible aspect to Kirk in which he is trying to find faith. And in large part, he's doing it because he doesn't like his fellow atheists or agnostics. But in 1942, as I mentioned the other day, he also has this experience in the shadow of the camelback in the high desert mountains of Utah where he becomes overwhelmed, and you can actually see it in his writing. I don't know if I can find it right now. and I don't know if I want to take the uh, take the time. But you know what? We are on... Ha! I am recording this, so I'm going to pause, and I'll be right back. Hey, everybody. I think I'm back. So uh, I had to look up that quote. Hopefully this is recording. If not, I'm going to be really bummed at the end that it wasn't recording. But in... September of 1942, after Kirk had had this experience in the shadow of the camelback, he writes this letter to his friend, his best friend, Bill McCann. He says, I've grown to endure the country in true stoic fashion, and I take a certain pleasure in feeling that I'm a tough inhabitant of one of the most blasted spots on the continent. There's enough leisure here, and that's a lot. The winters are said to be dreadful, but I have found fears exceed realities here as everywhere. Already we have had very cold mornings and evenings, and as I write, a great sand-laden wind, very chilly, is howling around the shacks of Dugway. Coming here tends to make me lean towards the stoic belief in special providence or perhaps more towards the belief of a Schopenhauer, that we are punished for our sins in proportion to our sins here on earth. For I had been talking of Stoicism for two or three months before I burst into Dugway, and there never was a better and sterner test of a philosophy within my little realm of personal experience. To be hurled from the pleasures of the mind and of the flesh, from prosperity and friends and ease, to so utterly desolate a plain, closed in by mountains like a yard within a spiked fence, and everywhere the suggestion of death and futility and eternal emptiness. But others without any philosophy live well enough here, and as Marcus Aurelius observes, if some who think the pleasures of the world good still do not fear death, why? should we. And he tells us that now that he is living in the desert, he has the true and unbelievable ability at this point and gift to experience a stoic life. And he concludes by saying, I have come to realize that everything good in Christianity is at first stoic. Right, that and that is really important for him. Right, he also records in his diary, quoting Zeno, that there is nothing good in the world but virtue, and it comes from reading his Stoic and the great Stoic philosophers while he's in the Great Salt Desert, in which Kirk starts comparing himself to Saint Anthony of the Desert, the great Eastern Orthodox monk who taught us about. Hermit, uh, being a hermit, and monasticism. Kirk starts really playing with these ideas, and 
we it really won't be until about 1952 or 53 that Kirk starts flirting with Orthodox Christianity. But there's no doubt that all of these things that are happening to him between about 1942 and 1953 are all moving him towards this belief in a God. And it's not there yet. But in 1953, Kirk starts, he meets a Jesuit by the name of Father Hugh O'Neill, and he starts taking instructions for him. That is, he wants to become a Roman Catholic, and he never finishes. And I, I don't know why. Uh, I had access to the letters, but I never quite figured out why Kirk didn't take that final step. And at least it was his own journey. He started moving towards Roman Catholicism, uh, but he quit. And he won't pick it back up again until 1964, when he yet again receives instruction. And then, as I mentioned the other day, in August of 1964, he joins the Catholic Church. He takes the name Augustine. So he becomes, he becomes Russell Amos Augustine Kirk. And he then marries his wife right after that. And they, of course, have a Catholic wedding and a Catholic marriage, and his wife is a cradle Catholic. So that's really a part of his faith journey. Now, I, I will mention, and I think it's great, I mean, I, I think it's wonderful that Kirk came to an Orthodox form of Christianity. But as I mentioned the other day, there is a kind of downside to this for at least a scholar's perspective. For Kirk, it's wonderful. But he does become somewhat less interesting in his writing after he converts to Catholicism because the kinds of big Big questions that he had always pursued were now answered. And for him, spiritually and morally, he is satisfied. And that's great. It's just reading him, he doesn't make the same kind of leaps and ask the same kind of questions that he had prior to his conversion. So we'll see that there's a kind of, uh, I won't say diminishment, but there's definitely a change in his writing and the way that he pursues truly large questions. He does have in his life two very interesting, what I might call miraculous moments. Uh, not that I'm any judge of miracles, but he does have two things in his life that I think really are interesting uh, in terms of his own spirituality. Number one, he becomes absolutely uh, obsessed, maybe too strong a word, but let's just say utterly excited and never losing that excitement. He becomes really taken with the Shroud of Turin. And the Shroud of Turin is supposedly, and it was one of the great debates in his life. I don't think the debate's quite as heated in 2020, but in the 1960s and 1970s, it was a huge debate. The Shroud was found, and many people claimed that the Shroud had the imprint of our Lord on it, the imprint from when the cloth was put over him after the crucifixion and before the resurrection, that the Shroud that was used to cover his dead body was that shroud, the Shroud of Turin, and that therefore we have this image of Christ. And Kirk, it almost sounds new agey, but Kirk became fascinated with the idea that if Jesus were truly the Logos, which he believed he was, but if Jesus were truly the Logos, in some way then, light particles from Jesus, from the Logos, formed the very shadow or imprint on the, the shroud. And therefore, when we looked at the shroud, we were seeing elements, not just like we might in communion, where we have the body of Christ, but something even beyond that, where in the shroud, we actually see the physical remains of the actual logos, the actual energy and light of Christ, the photons had made this. Um, I can't explain it any better than that. And those of you who've talked to me outside of class, you know, my scientific understanding is like zero. Uh, but that's how Kirk described it. And honestly, the way that he wrote about his love and intellectual fascination of the Shroud of Turin strikes me as a healthy obsession with a miracle in the way that Kirk approached it. But there's another thing that happened to him in his life that I think is even more miraculous. And that is towards the end of his life. Russell Kirk, as he was going in and out of consciousness in his last few days, and, and partly just into a normal dream state as well when he was sleeping in the last few days of his life, kept meeting this deceased Italian priest. 
And they started having really long philosophical conversations. And this priest is now a saint in the Catholic Church. His name's Padre Pio. Kirk had no idea who he was when he started dreaming about him. But they had several nights of conversations. And when Kirk told his wife, Annette, about this, uh, Annette was rather shocked. Because at that point, Father Padre Pio she knew that her husband really knew nothing about Padre Pio, uh, but also Padre Pio was very much kind of just an Italian saint. And for him to appear to Kirk it was a pretty, pretty big deal. But Kirk loved it. I mean, he had, they had great conversations, he said. Uh, he was some of the most amazing. And this was for nights and nights before Russell Kirk passed away. So uh, his religious life is interesting. And I... I don't think we would understand Kirk without understanding that religiosity. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, and I, I titled this whole lecture, basically Kirk as Mythmaker, I want to get into that idea as Kirk as Mythmaker. And I want to turn to a book, which is, I think, Kirk's finest book. Of the 36 he published, right, this this is, uh, or of the 30 odd books he published, this is my favorite of his nonfiction books. Right? So I'm, I'm excluding his fiction for a moment, but this is my favorite. I, I have read it innumerable times, and I even had the great privilege of editing a version of it. In fact, the latest version that came out, um, and it is called, well, we retitled it, but it was originally called A Program for Conservatives. Uh, he later retitled it Prospects for Conservatives, and that's what we called it when my friend Winston Elliott and I republished it for the imaginative conservative. Uh, but this is Kirk's finest book, I think. He was only 36 when he published it. The title itself is a joke because, as I mentioned earlier, when the conservative mind came out, one of the great criticisms of Russell Kirk was that he didn't use enough specific details about the politics of conservatism to give us a coherent picture of a political conservatism, which, of course, was never the intent of the conservative mind in any way, shape, or form. It is, in many ways, an anti-political book, or at least a, a pre-political book in some way. Anti, not as in A-N-T-I, but A-N-T-E, before politics, or trans-political in some way. So Kirk writes a program for conservatives in a white heat. It is his response to the critics of the conservative mind. And he says, all right, you want a program for conservatives? I'll give you a program for conservatives. But it's not going to be what you think that it is. And he starts telling us the story of Perseus and how Perseus has to strike in some way the Medusa, but to do so very famously without actually seeing the head of Medusa, which would have turned him into stone. And so Russell Kirk tells us in a couple of different things, he says, one thing I want you to note about the typical liberal and radical of our day is that each is smugness incarnate. If God was no longer in heaven, at least the planner was in a terrestrial paradise, according to these liberals and these radicals, and all was right with the world. They believed all they had to do was apply the scientific method to the problems of the world, and they would presently create heaven here on earth. There was no need for God. Indeed, what happens? Well, the conservative can be nothing but a lotus eater in this century. And so Kirk says, why are we then always trying to break the butterfly on the wheel? But why break a butterfly on the wheel, he asks. These illusions now are consigned to the dear dead days beyond recall. The terrible events of our time have buried John Dewey and the generation deeper than any pharaoh. So say what you might about the progressives, but they've already killed themselves because they don't know what they're doing in any way, shape, or form. And they have proven that time and time again. And where they have acted... They've interned innocent Japanese and put them in concentration camps, and they've built weapons to destroy civilian cities. That's your progress, Kirk says. You really want to be a progressive? Own up to it. You're racist and you're brutal. That 
There is no other way around it. But instead, the conservative understands that man and woman and nations and peoples all possess free will. They possess the free will of the mind, of the heart, and of the will. And the truth we must recognize in our time, as in every time, is hard. And truth is beautiful. But beautiful is beauty that is so stern and austere that it would terrify the luxuriousness of most of our liberals and our progressives. And so, as Edmund Burke said, not to shock all of them, we throw a decent, decent drapery over the worst parts of life. But we do so because we are realists. And then Kirk brings in the mythological element. And he says, it is critical that we understand that a true man, the true man, right? Not not the pretend man, not the half man, not the unman, but the true man. If he venerates the ashes of his father and the temples of his gods, will seek out terror, communism, fascism, tyranny at home as well as tyranny abroad. He will seek out that terror and he will strike with all the strength that is in him as Perseus once struck. Our time, Kirk says, is sick nigh unto death. We are sick of utilitarianism. We are sick of literalness. We as conservatives, as true men, cry out for myth. We cry out for parable. Great myths, Kirk says, are not merely susceptible of rational interpretation. They are truths transcendent truths. And we, as true men and women, must recognize that myth matters. These are not fairy tales. They are true stories couched in the drapery of the moral imagination, and we must accept these. But what do we see about evil? There is always power in evil, Kirk writes. It is infinitely subtle. It masks itself in fresh guises as a people grows older, and the sword snaps in the hand when the nightmare creature is metamorphosed into a lure of sensuality. And here he's making the point that when we look at the earliest Greek myths, that Medusa is this monster. But later on, as Greece becomes more sexual and more sensual, as Greece becomes more materialistic, the form of Medusa changes from a hideous monster serpent to a luring, bewitching, beautiful, but cunningly evil woman. And Kirk says it doesn't matter if our evil is as ugly as sin or as beautiful as sin. It is still sin in every way, and we must conquer it. And then Kirk says something that I think should be critically important for every one of us. In fact, if I didn't and I hadn't wanted to wait until this part of the semester to read this to you, if you had asked me at the very beginning of the semester, Dr. Berzer, I want two pages written out on what this Christian humanism really is, I would have given you this from Russell Kirk. The last two and a half pages of his opening chapter, which is called The Gorgon's Head to a Program for Conservatives. This all comes, and some of you may be especially happy with this, but this all comes from a speech Kirk gave in 1954 to the National Sorority of the Chi Omegas. One of Kirk's best friends was the president of the Chi Omegas in America, and he was asked to give the keynote speech in 1954. And so his keynote speech was, not surprisingly, given the Kayos, that it is it was about love, the meaning of love, and how do we understand love, especially in a world beset by communists and liberals and progressives, what happens with true love, where we've got all these people thinking of human beings as merely means to an end, how do we shift the focus and make the human person in her or his unique image of God, how do we recognize their dignity 
and their liberty. How do we recognize the absolute uniqueness of every single human life? And so Kirk told the Kayos, he said, I have tried rather to describe the task for true conservatives as it is given me to apprehend and to suggest here and now means and ends. If I thought I stood absolutely alone, I would never bother with this. One might as well shriek against the hurricane. But I believe that there are those who may read and hear these feeble sentences of mine and perhaps give these thoughts a greater degree of coherence and in time realize certain of these ideas in action. We are all part of a great continuity and essence. Now, that in and of itself is an astounding statement. From Adam to the last person, we are all part of a continuity and essence. But from God to the lowest creature or thing, we are also a part of the great continuity and essence. Our essence, our participation in reality, is both horizontal and vertical. And there's that cross. We are all part of a great continuity and essence and ought to rest content if we have done our own petty labor in obedience to what seems, according to our imperfect lights, the decree of providence. Some will be surprised that I have devoted very little of this book or that talk to present controversies, that I do not say much about men of the hour, but it happens to be my opinion that the profound causes of our present discontents lie elsewhere than in the fury of popular passion. If I do not write about the president or the senator or the governor, it is because I try not to think in slogans and to argue in personalities. The ephemeral moment so beloved by the popular journalist and the radio commentary is too much with us. Right? All of you who wanted my conservative mind to be a book about the immediacy of politics? Here's my answer. I'll give you a program for conservatives, but not in the way you think. Without men who do not take long-term views, we are in a pathless wilderness. In short, I do not think that the policies of the Federal Reserve, or the negotiations between General Motors and the United Auto Workers, or the struggle between factions of the Republican Party are causes for our perplexity. They are merely symptoms of larger problems. They are symptoms that require intelligent discussion. But that is someone else's work, not mine. I am concerned here with first principles, right reason. Not because I love abstract concepts, but because very few other men have anything to say at this present moment about first principles and eternal truths. And now... I'm going to tell you a secret. Before taking arms against an entire sea of troubles, I'm going to tell you one secret. For at the back of every discussion of the good society, there lies only one question. And that question is, what is the object of human life? Bears repeating. What is the object of human life? The true conservative does not believe that the end or aim of life is competition or success or enjoyment or longevity or power or possessions. I'm going to read that again because I think in our crazy consumerist pop culture world, one racked by the immediacies and angers and passions of social media, we so quickly stereotype what is this or that? And Kirk tells us the true conservative does not believe that the end or aim of life is competition or success or enjoyment or longevity or power or possessions. Instead, he believes this one truth, that the object of life is to love one another. He knows that the just and ordered society is that in which love governs us, so far as love can ever reign in this world of sorrows. 
and he knows that the anarchical or the tyrannical society is that in which love lies corrupt. He has learned that love is the source of all being, and that even hell itself was ordained by love. He understands that death, when we have finished the part that is assigned to us, is the reward of love, and he apprehends the truth that the greatest happiness ever granted to a man is the privilege of being happy in the hour of his death. Now think about Kirk's own death in April of 1994. He had dreams in which he had philosophical and theological discussions with Padre Pio. He loved it. His last thoughts, as far as we know on this earth, were the thoughts he had about Chesterton's Ballad of the White Horse, his favorite poem. And he was surrounded by his wife and his daughters who were singing hymns to him in his last moments. He apprehends the truth that the greatest reward ever granted to a man is the privilege of being happy in the hour of his death. The true conservative has no intention of converting this human society of ours into an efficient machine for efficient machine operators dominated by the master mechanics. The true conservative knows that men are put into this world to struggle, to suffer, and to contend against the evil that is in their neighbors and in themselves, but always to aspire to the triumph of love. They are put into this world to live like men and to die like men. The true conservative seeks to preserve a society which allows men to attain manhood, rather than keeping him within the bounds of perpetual childhood. And with Dante, the true conservative looks upward from this place of slime, this world of gorgons and chimeras, toward the light which gives love to this poor earth and all the stars. And with Edmund Burke and Plato, the true conservative knows that one will never love what one ought to love if one will not hate what one ought to hate. It's one thing to say those things. It's another to be able to live those things. And the last thing I want to state today, because I called this talk Charitable Mythmaker, is Russell Kirk's almost boundless charity. So if you remember, I told you that Russell Kirk made millions of dollars. It was through his speeches, through his writing. And when he died in 1994, he was essentially broke. And I think we could say, well, was he a good money manager or not? But what is more important is that Russell Kirk never believed, ever, that money was anything more than a gift to be given. Just as I might have a gift of whatever ability I have, I use it for my benefit, but for the benefit of all around me. The same thing is true with money. Money is a gift like anything else, and it must be used properly. When Russell Kirk died, one of his former students wrote of him, saying, In his own memoir, The Sword of Imagination, Kirk skimps on only one area, his immense charity. He mentions only briefly how he gave refuge from tyranny to Ethiopians, Vietnamese, Poles, and others. But there were many, many more. And he mentions only a few of the literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of people he helped over many decades, including young students. His charity was boundless. This was a man all Americans should know, and perhaps in a better age, they will know. This is very personal for us. For those of you who know my very great friend in econ, Ivan Pongrasik, Ivan was brought over for, from former Yugoslavia by Russell Kirk. Kirk did this for anybody who wanted to get out of Vietnam or Cambodia or out of the former Soviet Union or the East Eastern European satellites, any place that someone needed to escape to, they came to the Kirks. Annette, Kirk's widow, and Russell, when Russell was still alive, they would drive through Grand Rapids. They would pick up homeless people. They would go to battered women's shelters. They would go to the various pregnancy centers, and they would offer refuge to anyone. You want to have an abortion? Don't do it. 
come to our house, we'll not only allow you to give birth here, we'll pay for it, and then we'll pay for the baby after the baby's born, and we'll keep supporting you for as long as you need to get back onto your feet, either to take the baby as your own or to allow it to be adopted. This was not something that the Kirks did every once in a while. Starting in their marriage in 1964, they lived and breathed charity. I found, going through Russell Kirk's papers, his personal letters, I found letter after letter in the 1950s, long before Kirk even met Annette, where he would merely stuff several hundred dollar bills into an envelope and send it to people he had never met. But people who would write and say, I've just arrived from Hungary. I am a PhD, but I can't find any work. I'm searching all over New England trying to get a job. What would you recommend? Kirk would say, I know this person and this person. You need to contact this person. By the way, here's $1,000. Get set up. Kirk never once asked for that money back. In fact, there were letters that would come back 20 years later that would say, Dr. Kirk, I'm so sorry. I have never repaid you that money. And Kirk would respond by saying, if I had given you that money as anything other than a gift, I would be a shameful person. That was always a gift to get you back on your feet, to get you on your feet in the first place. Kirk did this over and over again, and he treated everybody he met with dignity. John Judas, who was a very liberal journalist, writes about his time visiting Kirk. He says, I first met Russell Kirk in 1982 when I was writing a biography of William F. Buckley Jr. Some of Buckley's friends and colleagues had rebuffed my requests for interviews. I was an unknown writer for a small leftist news weekly. But Kirk invited me to visit him in Macosta. Through clouds of pipe smoke, Kirk, a small, prim man with a gold pocket watch protruding from his vest pocket, answered my questions about Buckley and about the conservative movement. Later, he asked me to stay for dinner and with his family, and afterward insisted that I sleep over and resume our conversations in the morning. He was one of the most cordial persons I have ever met. Right? And that, that is Kirk right? in every way. You asked him for something, he gave you everything he could, including the shirt off his back, if you needed it. Kirk was the most living embodiment of charity I have ever encountered after a formal story of the saints. This man lived and breathed his charity. He was weird, he was eccentric, he was quirky, but for all of that, he was undeniably charitable. And my favorite story about Russell Kirk is that he gave shelter to a man by the name of Clinton Wallace, who was a giant of a man. He had just been released on parole from a New York prison, and he was making his way across all of the upper states into the Great Lakes and into Michigan. And he was Catholic, which is very important to the story because he, he wasn't all there, but he was probably in, in some way uh, deeply autistic. And he, he had this incredible intelligence and this ability to recite anything from memory, but especially poetry. But I say it's important he's Catholic because he would only rob from Catholic churches. Um, he did not rob from Protestant churches because he did not believe they were legitimate. So he only robbed from Catholic churches. But Annette met him while he was hitchhiking across the highway that goes through Macosta, and he was waiting outside of their parish, St. Michael Parish, and, and reciting poetry, asking for money after a first Friday mass. And Annette went back home, and she woke Russell up because he was still asleep, and said, Russell, you've got to wake up. We've got this interesting homeless man coming down the road. And so they waited, and it was during a blizzard. And they waited until this homeless man walked by their house. And Russell, of course, dressed in his three-piece tweed with a tie. You would never entertain guests, no matter who they were, without dressing like that. And they went out. This was in the late 1960s. And they went out, and they invited Clinton in for, for brunch. And they liked him so much that they asked him to stay with them permanently. And Russell called the New York Corrections Facility and said, I will take this parolee under my wing. And they did. And Clinton lived with them 
for the next decade off and on. And he was a problem at times. Uh, he'd get really restless. He was an alcoholic. He was never abusive. He treated Russell Kirk's four daughters like absolute queens. He loved them dearly. But who among us would just take an ex-con into our house, an alcoholic with kind of serious problems? Um, and yet, that's what Kirk did. This guy was so trusted that on Ash Wednesday of 1975, of all days, and talk about making myth, on Ash Wednesday, he accidentally left the fireplace open and Russell Kirk's home burned down, uh, burned to the ground, right? Did Kirk kick him out? No, this was life. This is the cost of charity. This is what happens. And of course, Clinton eventually passed away. And where is he buried? He's buried right next to Russell Kirk in St. Michael's Cemetery in Macosta, Michigan. And his headstone doesn't say ex-convict or professional hobo. It says Clinton Wallace, a knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, of the road. That is the essence of Kirk's charity. That is the essence of the wardrobe of the moral imagination. Each one of us could tear each other down. We could each find our faults. We could even define each other by the worst thing we ever did. Kirk did not do that. Kirk saw with God's eyes. And that is the third miracle of Russell Kirk. Thank you.